So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our executive leadership conference today and joining our first round of sessions. Joining me is Samantha Seabrook. She is an employment lawyer and founder at Seabrook Workplace Law, a boutique employment law firm that provides a goal-oriented approach to your employment law needs. Samantha's experience in disability workers' compensation, WSIB, occupational health and safety, and human rights ensures you get a broad perspective on your employment law matters. The firm offers advice to both employers and employees. Samantha regularly speaks and writes on employment law topics, including accommodation of mental health disabilities, changes to the workers' compensation system, workplace investigations, and due diligence in occupational health and safety. Thank you, Samantha, for uh, taking the time today and uh, sharing uh, one of your presentations. Um, good luck, and uh, if you need anything, I'll, I'll be here. Um, just I'll I can uh, communicate with you on the chat if you need anything. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So thanks so much for having me speak today. We're going to be talking about the hot topic of COVID-19 vaccination policies in the workplace. And today we're going to be focusing more on whether or not you can terminate for cause with a vaccination policy and having a worker that's not, uh, not complying with that policy. So I'm going to start my presentation um, just because of some technical issues. Uh, when I start the presentation, I'm actually not going to be able to see the chat box. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat box and I'll look at the, we'll address them at the end. Okay. Thanks so much. So we're here in this new world of work. Um, you know, many organizations are choosing different models of work, whether it be a hybrid or flexible model of work um, where people are working a couple of days in the office or choosing how many days they, they wanna be in the office versus being at home. We have organizations that are doing hoteling where they're getting rid of dedicated offices and people have to book a desk in more in more um, open environment. And uh, co-working spaces are becoming very popular again after everyone ha uh, left them during the pandemic. And this is, I'm bringing this up because when we think about this new world of work, when we think about how we are working and how we are interacting, what we have to then start doing is think of think about how we're going to protect our employees, our coworkers, our suppliers, our clients, our customers, and the public from COVID-19. So this means about thinking about how to protect your own workers, thinking about how to protect people coming into your workplace, um, and how to comply with your duties under various legislative regimes, most particularly under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, employers have a general obligation to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of a worker. This is a very broad obligation, and as you can imagine, um, it leaves a lot open to interpretation. But it's really because of this particular obligation that employers have been pushing to implement mandatory vaccine policies um, outside of any government requirement to have them. So when we look at what is going to be enforceable and not enforceable by a court, by an arbitrator, really the first place we need to start is to, is to think about these obligations. Because what's a reasonable precaution in one workplace may not be a reasonable precaution in another workplace. Um, but what we're finding is many, if not most employers, are erring on the side of caution by implementing mandatory vaccine policies that give them the ability to terminate a, a worker for cause if that worker chooses not to get uh, vaccinated by the by whatever data stipulated in the policy. And we can understand why employers are going, going this route because under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, there are huge fines that can be imposed on employers if, if someone is, becomes very sick or if someone um, 
dies from COVID-19. You know, the under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, the maximum fine for a corporation is one million five hundred thousand dollars. That's a huge fine. And then for individuals, the the fine is up to a hundred thousand dollars and up to twelve months uh, imprisonment. So these uh, penalties are not small. They're not um, not something to be dismissive of, and that's why we're seeing um, organizations implement um, this kind of mandatory vaccine policy. Uh, on another note, there, there can also be some criminal liability that uh, is implied for not taking all of these precautions to protect workers. Under the criminal code section 217.1, um, there is liability for workplace deaths and injuries. So everyone who undertakes or has the the authority to direct how another person does work or performs a task is under a legal duty to take reasonable steps to prevent bodily harm to that person. Um, so I'm sharing all of this so that we can understand why it's important to take these responsibilities seriously and to give us that context for how for perhaps how these mandatory vaccine policies are going to be interpreted by, by courts. Because well, there's no doubt that an employer can have a, a policy. It's what, it's what penalties they can impose if a worker can't or chooses not to um, comply with the policy. So the big gray area right now um, is whether or not an employer can terminate someone for cause for not getting vaccinated, right? You can terminate people without cause by paying them their notice and their severance um, under the ESA, under their contract or under common law. You can terminate them for, for whatever reason, as long as it's not discriminatory or reprisal. Um, so the, the question that everyone is waiting for an answer on is whether employers can terminate for cause and not have to pay notice or severance pay um, to an employer to an employee that chooses not to get vaccinated. So right now we don't have many decisions um, about COVID-19 mandatory vaccination policies. Um, we the few decisions we have are from the unionized context, so from labor arbitrators. Um, so consider how, if these are applicable to a non-unionized environment, but this is what we have. Um, and as you can see, the scorecard is uh, evenly matched uh, at this point. Um, and the considerations that labor arbitrators are, are factoring into their decision making really go to this concept of reasonableness. So uh, labor arbitrators are considering whether or not the policy, the policies as, as written and implemented are reasonable or unreasonable. So in one decision, Paragon Protection and UFCW, um, the arbitrator looked at a mandatory vaccine policy with regard to a security guard company. So this security guard company um, would place its, its staff in various types of environments, you know, could be a hospital, it could be a construction site, it could be, you know, a shopping mall. Um, so many different types of workplaces, many different types of environments. Um, and they implemented a vaccination policy that required all employees to be vaccinated by October 31st, 2021. Um, in this case, the majority of Paragon's clients um, had also implemented mandatory vaccination policies. So its clients were requiring that every person that was a that was attending on their site or working on at their sites um, had to be vaccinated in order to continue working there. Um, so Paragon implemented its mandatory vaccine policy. It required uh, people to be vaccinated by certain dates. Um, and the arbitrator in this case found that the vaccination policy was reasonable, enforceable, and compliant with both the Ontario Human Rights Act and the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The arbitrator found that the policy in this case struck an appropriate balance between respecting the rights of employees um, who had not or did not wish to be vaccinated while respecting the safe uh, safe work while respecting the ability to create a safe workplace um, for for coworkers and for um, workers uh, on on the sites in which the security guards would would go and visit. 
Um, the, the arbitrator also discussed in this decision and distinguished um, mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policies from older arbitration decisions um, about flu shots um, and other types of vaccination requirements. Um, there, you know, there are those cases that exist largely in the healthcare sector that um, kind of fall on both sides of, of the fence about whether or not mandatory vaccine policies are reasonable or unreasonable. And this arbitrator um, distinguish those older cases because of the nature of, of COVID-19 versus an influenza, for example. Um, and he, in doing so, the arbitrator compared the higher infection rates of COVID-19 compared with the, with the flu and the fatality rates of COVID-19 compared with the flu. Uh, in this case, too, the arbitrator also honed in on a section in the collective agreement that required um, security guards to have vaccines if required to, to have them to attend at a client site. So in that case, the, the collective agreement actually gave that management right to, to Paragon to implement. On the other side of things, we have the decision by arbitrator Stout and Electrical Safety Authority and uh, PWU. Um, arbitrator Stout was considering a policy that required all employees to give proof of vaccination by December 22nd, 2021, or face disciplinary action up to and including termination. Um, Arbitrator Stout found that those consequences in the in this context, um, at least at this stage, were were unreasonable. Partly because the employer had permitted COVID nineteen testing as an alternative to vaccination um, prior prior to implementing this policy, and the employer was not able or did not produce any evidence to suggest why that those circumstances had changed and why testing was not providing an appropriate amount of uh, protection to its employees and to, to other people. Um, so further, uh, in what Arbitrator State was very careful about, though, was to be very clear that workplace settings in which the stakes are very high, so healthcare, childcare settings, you know, where there is an environment where perhaps the Ill elderly or children are, are present, that those kinds of high risk um, environments may be uh, better suited to having a mandatory vaccination policy. He was very he was very careful in his decision to be very clear that this decision was very much based on the specific context of this workplace and was not um, a triumph for people that are trying to challenge uh, vaccination policies. Um, he, and in, on that point, arbitrator Stout was also very clear and very careful to emphasize that the situation surrounding COVID-19 is fluid. So whereas he was finding that at this particular juncture, the, the specific policy in this specific workplace was not, was not reasonable, that that could change depending on the fluidity of the COVID-19 situation. So if things got worse and and let's say there was evidence that testing was no longer um, sufficient to protect workers in the workplace, then this decision could change. So while, while at the end of the day, the specific policy in the specific workplace was found to be unreasonable, arbitrator Stout left the door wide open to that decision changing depending on the circumstances and the evidence available. So reasonableness. So what's clear from the arbitration decisions, the few that we have uh, available to us, is that reasonableness is going to be the driving consideration when assessing whether an employer can terminate unvaccinated workers for just cause. When we start to evaluate whether our um, COVID-19 mandatory vaccine policies are reasonable, we need to first look at 
at our workplace. What does our workplace look like? How have we changed our workplace because of COVID-19? If Is everyone working remotely? Um, if everyone's working remotely and they're not required to interact in person, they're not required to interact with customers, clients, with the public, you know, in making everyone take COVID-19 vaccine might not be reasonable in those circumstances. You know, applying the analyses that we, we just saw from these two arbitration decisions. However, when we're starting to look at more interaction, is everyone in the office, is everyone attending at the workplace? When we consider whether testing is a viable option or, or has been being, or testing has been used up until a certain point, you know, these are all going to factor into whether terminating someone for cause is going to be seen as reasonable under a mandatory vaccine policy. And a lot of that reasonableness um, and the uh, reasonableness of implementing a mandatory vaccine policy is going to first look at what uh, your statutory requirements are and what local public health authorities are, are saying to do. Um, you know, first off, hospitals, um, community care service providers, child care settings, long-term care homes, retirement homes, they all have very specific uh, regulations. Um, so we're not in, in a 30 minute presentation, we don't have time to go through each of those regimes. So I'm sorry if I'm leaving your particular workplace, uh, workplace out if you work in, in one of these sectors. Um, but we're gonna focus on everyone else outside of these specific industries. So all other employers by regulation under uh, regulation 36420 of the uh, rules for areas at step three um, and the roadmap uh, for exit steps under the reopening Ontario uh, legislation. So all other employers have to abide by the Occupational Health and Safety Act, again, taking every reasonable precaution in the circumstances, and they must also be in compliance with the advice, recommendations, and instructions of public health officials. So Ontario has 34 public health units, um, many of which have provided some form of recommendation or instruction regarding workplace vaccination policies. Uh, please look at the specific public um, health guidance in your region. In Toronto, for example, Toronto Public Health is uh, strongly recommending that all employers implement a vaccination policy in their in their workplaces. But this is the first step. So when we're when we're looking at a reason the reasonableness of a policy the legislative impetus for implementing a policy is going to be important, right? So if Toronto Public Health is saying that an employer should have a, a mandatory vaccine policy, that's going to take you that extra step in having your policy seen as, as reasonable. Um, where the legal re requirements for a vaccination policy kind of leave room for uh, employer's discretion regarding implementing alternatives to vaccination, employers have to carefully assess the safety and potential infection hazards for their unique workplace to determine whether those alternatives are appropriate. Is your organization able to implement testing? Is testing going to be appropriate considering the types of interactions and who is interacting in your in your work environment? Um, these these are questions that you should be asking yourself when you're considering. Okay, are we doing kind of a hybrid model where? You know, we want people to be vaccinated, but if they're not vaccinated, they have to get tested at a at certain intervals and provide their their testing proof. Um, or in our workplace, is it only going to work that that people are vaccinated, and that's the only thing that we're going to accept? So we need to always keep that reasonableness standard in our mind and consider the specific context of of your workplace. When it comes to key considerations for vaccination policies, we want to we want to keep a few things in mind. We want to, if we are ever called upon to establish reasonableness with a court, with an arbitrator, we want to um, determine the 
the evidence that we're demonstrating. So we want to be able to show evidence that there's a serious risk of infection in our workplace and that and the effectiveness of a vaccine or alternative measure in preventing the spread of that infection in your workplace. What, what we learned from, from the arbitration decisions is that arbitrators, decision makers are going to be looking at whether or not your vaccination policy achieves a balance between workplace safety, employee privacy is a very important consideration, and of course, human rights protections. We have to remember that our vaccination policies have to have carve outs and have to have measures for those that are are unable to be vaccinated either due to disability or due to a religious belief and having a, a system in place in our workplace to receive that information and make decisions based on, on those that are requesting accommodation because of a protected ground under the human rights code. So the enforceability of any vaccination policy is going to ultimately be judged based on the statutory requirements that are applicable to your specific workplace. And if there is any discretion left to an employer, um, whether that discretion um, has been exercised reasonably. And we're focusing on this balance to achieve reasonableness, to strengthen our ability to be able to terminate unvaccinated workers for just cause. So I went over a couple of arbitration decisions. Those may or may not be followed in the case of non-unionized employees. So let's look at and review some key principles about just cause for, for termination. So when we talk about uh, cause for termination, there are two things we two spheres of the law that that can apply. We have the common law, and then we have the Employment Standards Act here here in Ontario. So first, we're going to look at the common law. Um, where an employee is terminated for just cause under the common law, they're not going to be entitled to reasonable notice or payment in lieu of notice um, for common law reasonable notice. However, they may still be entitled to Employment Standards Act statutory minimums for notice and severance pay, which I'm going to address in just a minute. The hallmark of assessing whether or not an employer has just cause to dismiss an employee is based in the context of the workplace, of the situation that is unfolding, and whether or not that termination for cause is proportional to the context. Just cause at common law requires the employer to show some proof of misconduct that constitutes a repudiation of the employment relationship. So something about the employee's actions indicates that they no longer wish to uh, be bound by their, their terms and conditions of employment. And in order to show that in many cases, what a court's going to be looking at is whether or not there has been proportional and progressive discipline in order to show that the employer has established just cause for termination. So for example, where an employer is legislatively required to only permit vaccinated workers in the workplace or reasonably elected not to offer testing as an alternative, and where an employee has refused to be vaccinated without any valid ground for accommodation, like I said, disability or um, religious belief, and this employee has had a history of insolence or insubordination, um, perhaps where he's, they've been given chance after chance after chance to comply with the vaccination policy and they've received extended timelines, et cetera, then all of these factors can weigh in favor of an employer having just cause for termination under the common law. It works a bit differently under the Employment Standards Act. So under the Employment Standards Act, uh, an employer has to establish a higher threshold to have just cause for termination. And that higher threshold is because the language in the ESA requires that the employee be guilty of willful misconduct, disobedience, or willful neglect of duty that's not trivial and has not been condoned by the employer. 
So you can already see based on the language there that this element of willfulness is going to elevate the the burden on the employer to prove that the that the employee was has engaged in willful misconduct, disobedience or willful neglect of duty. Um, Case law has interpreted this concept of willfulness under the Employment Standards Act to, to mean kind of careless, thoughtless, heedless, or inadvertent conduct. Um, or sorry, that that those kinds of those those elements, carelessness, thoughtlessness, heedlessness, that those are not sufficient to be willfulness. The employer has to show an intentionality or deliberateness on the part of the employee to establish um, just cause for termination under the Employment Standards Act. So that so the employer must show that the employee purposefully engaged in conduct that he or she knew to be serious misconduct. You know, basically you need to show that the employee was being bad on purpose to establish just just cause under the Employment Standards Act. Um, there's this idea of subjective intent, almost akin to like a criminal law intent that the that the employee knowingly engaged in the, in this kind of misconduct. And because proving that kind of subjective intent um, is a very high bar for our employers, many are choosing to provide statutory notice and severance pay even when there is pretty serious misconduct, right? I'm sure all of you in your organizations have been faced with that decision where you have just cause under the common law, but you're still going to pay statutory notice and severance because you you're not sure or you're not quite there in terms of being able to establish this willfulness um, element under the Employment Standards Act. So these same considerations apply when we talk about COVID-19 policies. Um, and like I said, for the common law considerations, um, even more so for, for the statutes Tory threshold for just cause, where there's legislated standards or public health orders requiring employers to um, implement mandatory vaccine policies, it, the more likely that the policy itself is going to be seen as justified. So when the vaccination policy is fully compliant with that specific legislation or the health directives, where it's striking that appropriate balance between those um, between the legislative requirements, workplace health and safety, employee privacy, and human rights. And there's no legitimate ground for the refusing employee to claim human rights protection. And where that employee has been given chance after chance to comply with the policy, that there has been an element of progressive discipline to get them to comply with the policy, then taken together, these factors could amount to willful misconduct. But when you're thinking about term, if you want to achieve just cause under the Employment Standards Act, you have to take like slow progressive steps so that you can build the evidence to show that this employee is willfully not, not going to comply with the employer's legislatively required directive. So that slide's just capturing capturing what I what I said, um, building that that uh, that evidence to establish willful misconduct. So when it comes to terminating for cause, it's we're we're in a a gray area. There's really no there's no clear cut answer on how courts and adjudicators are going to. Um, see these policies, how they're going to um, see whether or not just uh, having just implemented a policy and then executing the policy will be just cause for termination. So that means that the decision to terminate an employee for cause um, involves both a business decision and legal considerations. And, and because of that, it should be approached with care. What I'm seeing a lot in my practice is um, smaller organizations have, I think, a little bit more of a, a, a little bit more of a data set on 
how many of its employees are vaccinated or not vaccinated um, or will plan to get vaccinated. Um, and because of that, they're, they're able to um, make a more considered choice. So if it's a 20 person organization and there's only one person that's going to choose, choose not to be vaccinated and in all of the circumstances of vaccination is a, is a reasonable requirement. Well, if that one person is somebody that um, there's been problems with before and it wouldn't be so bad if they left the organization, um, we've been working to craft what can hopefully be a, an easy, easy exit. Um, some employers are choosing to just just pay a severance package and you know get the get the um, release and indemnity agreement signed off on. Um, that's uh, that's always a good peace of mind. Whereas other employers that are dealing maybe with a, a larger group of employees that are choosing not to get vaccinated are having other considerations, right? So now if we're in a 70 person organization and we have a group of 10 or 15 people, it's all of a sudden starting to be a much bigger cost if you're looking at terminating without cause and providing a severance package. Um, and we're, we're taking a reassessment of how they've implemented their policy whether or not we can strengthen their ability to terminate for cause by, you know, giving that progressive discipline of uh, suspension if that's a if that's available, or or lengthening the amount of time that people have to um, get vaccinated, and if they're not, then um, do we need to look at? giving them yet another warning so that we, it's really about building the record so that we can start to establish that willfulness element um, to terminate for cause. Um, as I've been explaining, there's multiple factors that are going to weigh into to the analysis of whether you want to terminate for cause or, or not. Um, shorter service employees, maybe it's best to just give them give them their ESA notice and, and be done with it, especially if there's only a handful of them in your organization. Longer service employees, there's bigger costs involved um, for, for that kind of termination. So we want to perhaps be more mindful about the costs. And sometimes there's a principled reason for, for just for taking a principled approach to how you're going to handle these employees. Um, and that's why there are some circumstances where an employer just taking a blanket approach that if you're not vaccinated, you're going to be terminated for cause is is how other organizations have been implementing their their vaccination policies. So all to say, in this um, evolving world of mandatory vaccine policies, um, a considered approach, uh, definitely seek legal counsel when you are both implementing your policies, but also when you're considering termination um, for non-compliance with a policy. Uh, there are too many variables that are, that are moving every day with um, decisions that are being made, um, either from arbitrators, we, we likely won't see any court decisions for a while, considering the backup in the in the court system. Um, but also paying attention to other other decisions that are being made. I have to say, there's been quite a lot of conversation about. Um, mandatory vaccination policies in the light of the Ontario government's announcement that it may um, remove all COVID-19 uh, restrictions and requirements as of March 2022, um, which is not that far away, and how that's going to impact um, the reasonableness of implementing a mandatory vaccine policy now. So pay attention to how things are evolving um, and uh, Wishing everyone good luck on, on implementing their mandatory vaccine policies. So I'm going to end the end the slideshow now, um, and uh, we're going to see if anyone has uh, has any questions. Um, Oh, I apologize if uh, if I haven't been clear and if uh, people have if it's been breaking up during the presentation. I'm hoping that uh, most people have heard it. 
So we're I'm I'm happy to take any questions. We still have just a few minutes left before before the end of the presentation. You can put them in in the chat box uh, or the Q and A box um, here in the in the browser window. Oh, thanks so much, Jonathan. That's very kind of you. <laughs> well, it's two o'clock and I know that there there's another session starting now and I'm sure all of you want to to attend that. So thanks so much for having me. Please feel free anytime to reach out and uh, we can have a discussion about your mandatory vaccine policies or, or any other topic uh, related to your workplace. Have a nice day. <laughs>